Today I'm going to talk about Metal Iron Space DMP, but before I go into that, I would like to, to thank uh, a few people. So first, I'd like to thank my, my PI, Michal, for, for introducing me and explaining to me uh, DMP. But I also would like to, to thank my, my colleagues, past and current, for, for many, many discussions about DMP and, and EPR and, and related topics. So I think that this presentation today is kind of a, a summary of all these discussions that we've had in, in, over the past years. So a quick uh, overview about uh, what I'm going to be talking today. So I want to start with a little introduction to uh, metal ion DMP and what the solid effect DMP mechanism is. Then I'm going to go a little bit more into, into the math. So we're going to talk about continuous uh, wave DMP and what is the polarization at the steady state. Then I'm going to talk about the Hamiltonian that is relevant for DMP that we need to understand in the, the DMP mechanism. And at the end, I also want to talk about paramagnetic relaxation enhancement. And I hope that with all these ingredients together, I will be able to, to convince you about uh, the statement that the DMP enhancement can be independent of the distance between the polarizing agent and the, the nuclear that are being enhanced. So with that, um, if you have done yourself some magic angle spinning DMP at high magnetic fields, it's very likely that you, 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 you did following this approach called exogenous DNP. It's a very popular approach and it's very powerful. And it consists of soaking your sample of interest in this so-called uh, DMP juice, which contains some organic radicals. And then in the ex uh, DMP experiment, you, you cool down your sample to something like 100 Kelvin and irradiate it with microwaves. Then the, this way, you are, uh, it is possible to transfer the polarization from the, from the electron spins to the nearby proton nuclei. Then through proton spin diffusion, the hyperpolarization is spread throughout the DMP juice until it reaches the, the, the surface of your sample. And then you can enhance the surface of your samples. So, so one of the, the limit or the, the, the main limitation of this approach is that it, the enhancements are mostly limited to the surface. And this is especially true for unprotonated samples like inorganic solids. So for this reason, our group, we are working with a different approach, this so-called endogenous DMP, which is, if you want, more, a more old school approach. It, it consists in introducing uh, paramagnetic metal dopants into, into the sample. So we dope our sample with some um, metal ions that are paramagnetic in nature, meaning they have uh, unpaired electron spins. And then the experiment is, is basically the same. So we cool down our samples to 100 Kelvin and irradiate with, with microwaves. And this way we are enhancing the, the polarization of the, of the surrounding nuclei. And the nice thing about this is that we get enhancement of the bulk of our sample. And moreover, these enhancements uh, can be homogeneous throughout the, the sample. So we're getting quantitative spectra. And while we are doing this, so here are a few examples from our group um, as, as a motivation. So we, we, we are interested in just in getting a higher sensitivity so that we can perform NMR exper experiments that would be unfeasible otherwise. So for example, this work by, by Tamar Wolf, she looked at natural abundance oxygen-17 NMR spectra. And with, from the NMR parameters of oxygen-17, she was able to, to give some, so obtain some information about the crystal structure of this material. Another example is we looked at two-dimensional homonuclear uh, correlation spectra of yttrium-89. The challenge here is that yttrium is, has one of the lowest gyromagnetic ratios of the entire periodic table. So this experiment wouldn't be possible without the sensitivity gain from DMP. And here, what we were looking at was uh, oxygen vacancy distribution in these materials that are uh, oxygen ion conductors. But uh, lately, we're also um, focusing on introducing this, this approach to, to study different type of, of materials. So for example, this work by Shira Haber, she, she looked at, um, titanium oxide particles that were coated with a layer, uh, with, with some artificial coating layers. And then she, she studied these layers uh, via combining endogenous DMP approach and exogenous DMP approach. So this way she was not only able to get information about the, uh, about the composition of these layers, but even more she was able to gain information about the uh, gradient, the structural gradient of, the, of this, um, coating layers. And uh, recently in, in, in a running, uh, in, in a project that is still running, so Ran uh, Abutbul is doping cadmium sulfide nanoparticles with uh, paramagnetic manganese. And in doing so, he wants to study the, mecha the mechanisms uh, of growth of these nanoparticles. 
Okay, so uh, one moment. So let me start by 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 explaining what what are the 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 main ingredients that we need for for doing DNP. So first of all, we need a source of unpaired electron, and as I said before, we do this by by doping our sample with uh, paramagnetic metal ions, and then doing so, we introduce a uh, oh sorry, we introduce uh, interactions between the nuclei and the unpaired electron, and. Uh, um, so each of these nucleus will be coupled through, uh, through space diaper coupling with the electron spin. And thankfully, we can treat this, uh, these, the, this coupling of, of, of the nuclei individually. So we just have to look at uh, the coupling of the electron to one of these nuclei. And we can explain this coupling by, by a simple two-spin system consisting of the electron spin and the nuclear spin. So we can draw an energy level diagram that has uh, obviously four energy levels. and the, you can see the energy gap between the electron transitions is much larger than energy gap between the nuclear transition. And this is due to the fact that electron spins have much larger diamagnetic ratios, so up to a, to a factor of thousands, depending on which nuclear we are looking at. And due to the larger uh, uh, gap between the en energy levels, also the population difference uh, is going to be much larger for the electron spins compared to the NMR transition. So here, these, these, these circles here are supposed to represent and the population of each of these individual energy levels. Then the next ingredient that we need for DMP is a, a microwave irradiation. So we do this in our lab with a commercial system. So we have a, a gyrotron that emits microwave at a frequency of 263 gigahertz. And yeah. And, and then the last step that, uh, that we need is we need the ability to change the magnetic field. So to sweep the, the, the external the large magnetic field, B0. And once we have this, we can start recording NMR spectra. So here is a, it's an example from our group. So this is a, the, an NMR spectrum that we recorded under microwave radiation. And the next thing that we do is we, we integrate uh, the intensity of the entire spectrum. And this is plotted over here. So the intensity versus the field at which we are. And in this particular case, we started at a field that was, was too large. So we started reducing the, the, the magnetic field. And when we do this, when we do this, we get the energy levels closer and closer together, and we can continue doing this until, at some point, we're gonna hit the the so-called um, solid effect condition, where the irradiation frequency of the microwaves is exactly equal to the energy gap between this double quantum transition. So at this point, we have the maximum DNP enhancement. If we continue reducing the the the, the size of the magnetic field, at some point, we're gonna hit the uh, we, we're going to um, hit the zero quantum transition uh, with the microwave. And at this point, we have the maximum negative DMP enhancement. So it is negative because in this case, the population of the lower energy level is smaller than the population of the larger energy level. And so all in all, if we finish this experiment, we, we get uh, what is called the DNP field sweep profile. And from these profiles, uh, we can learn a lot about the, the DMP mechanism that is in play in this particular experiment. But today, I'm just going to focus on the solid effect mechanism. And so let's look a little bit more closer uh, into the solid effect conditions. So as I said, the solid effect condition is uh, whenever the, the energy gap between the, the double quantum transition, for instance, equals the, the, the energy of the microwave irradiation. And the, the way we are obtaining the NP enhancement, or when, when this happens, what, what, what occurs is that we are, we are trying to we are starting to equalize the population of these two energy levels as, as you can see here and at the same time we have to always take into account the effect of electron relaxation so electron electron relaxation rates are the fastest rate uh, throughout the experiment and because they are the fastest they will always ensure that the po um, population difference between the electron transitions this and this stays constant so the, 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 the EPR signal basically is not changing as we, as we do this experiment. And if we now look at uh, how the population state changes over time, uh, this is shown here in this figure. So here you can see the population versus time. And at thermal equilibrium, um, we don't see the, the, the population difference between the nuclear states, uh, between these two states, uh, it, between the, the NMR transition is basically uh, we cannot even see it in, the, in this scale because we are because it's so much smaller than the population difference between the electron spins. And then at time t equals zero, we start uh, the, the the microwave irradiation. 
So at this point, what, what, what happens is, as, as I mentioned before, the, two, the population of these two energy levels start getting closer together. And at the same time, due to the effect of electron relaxation, the other two energy um, the, the other two populations also change with time. So just by looking at this figure, uh, we, we can actually already see how large our nuclear uh, enhancement is going to be. So basically, the, the nuclear polarization is just going to be the electron polarization minus the difference of the population of this double quantum uh, transition. So the difference in population of these two uh, states. You can see if we are able to fully saturate this, this transition, meaning that the, the, that the energy, uh, the population of these two energy levels is equal, then the nuclear, so then delta P double quantum is going to be zero and the nuclear polarization equals the electron polarization. So this is, this is the maximum theoretical uh, possible DNP enhancement. So basically, if we want to know the enhancement, all we need to know is how efficient are we saturating this transition. However, this is a little bit more challenging. Than, uh, this is a little bit challenging because there are many, many, many effects going on at the same time during a DNP experiment. But thankfully, as NMR spectroscopists, we know how to solve this problem. And this was done first uh, by Felix Bloch in the, in the early days of NMR. So he showed how to solve the saturation efficiency for our one spin system, so consisting of two energy levels under continuous irradiation of well, radio frequency in this case. So and the way to proceed here is, uh, he wrote some uh, rate equations describing how the population of the different energy levels, one and two, is changing over time. So basically, this looks like equations you, you might be familiar from uh, kinetics, for instance. So basically, the population of this first energy level is changing due to, due to the relaxation up to the, to, the, to the other energy level with a rate uh, W uh, arrow up. At the same time, it's also increasing due to uh, spins that are relaxing down from two to one with the rate uh, W arrow down. And these two rates note that they are, they are not equal. Otherwise, to, otherwise the, the polarization, if they were equal, we wouldn't have any polarization at thermal equilibrium. And in addition, due to the, to the, to, due to the um, pulse or the continuous wave irradiation, uh, we are also creating incoherences. And at the same time, from, from the population to coherence, and at the same time, we're getting uh, population back from the coherences. So we can write the rate equation for both populations and for the coherences. And now to solve these equations, the first step that, uh, that we have to do is we have to look, or we're going to look at the difference between the, the populations. So how the difference in population changes over time, basically how, how the polarization of the system is changing. And so we do this just by, by subtracting one uh, equation by the other. And at the same time, um, we can look at, how, how, at the difference of the coherences. So we get this equation. And then if we rearrange this equation a little bit and introducing a, a, a new variable, this uh, delta P equilibrium, basically the population difference at thermal equilibrium, we, we, we can rewrite these two equations to, to this over here. And then to, to finally solve this, we, we, can, we can solve it for the steady state case. So at the steady state, the, the change is gonna be zero, right? There, there, there won't be, the populations are not going to change anymore. That's that's the definition of the steady state. And when we when we equalize these two, uh, if we put these two equations equal to zero, we can equalize them, and from that we get the, the Bloch equation for saturation. And what this equation is telling us, us is that the population difference or the polarization of this energy uh, of this system over here is equal to the population difference at thermal equilibrium divided by one plus the notation frequency squares time the longitudinal and transverse relaxation, the inverse of the longitudinal and transverse relaxation rates. So we can do this exact same procedure for our system consisting of two spins. It's gonna be a little bit more complicated, obviously, because there are many more paths that, that we have to take into account, but, but the principle is exactly the same. And if we do this, I'm not gonna do it, uh, not gonna do it now, but if we do it and um, we get to an equation and that looks perfectly analog to the, to the one for the one spin system. So we have that the, the population difference, the polarization of this double quantum transition that we are irradiating you know, with microwaves is equal to the population difference at thermal equilibrium divided by one plus um, the notation frequency square times the transfer relaxation rate inverse of it plus the um, longitudinal relaxation rates also inverse. So there are a few differences compared to the, to the, to the block equation of uh, of a single spin system, and which I'm going to highlight over here. So first of all, there are uh, various uh, longitudinal relaxation rates that we have to take into account. And the reason for that is that uh, if we try to 
uh, saturated transition, not only the double quantum R1 or relaxation rate is trying to counteract this, our, our efforts to saturate this and go back to, to, to Sportsman equilibrium, but the system has also the, the, the possibility of going through to this other pathway and trying to, to get back to, to its desired uh, Boltzmann equilibrium. So that's, that's, that's how these two terms come in here. And in addition, I, as you maybe noticed that I added like this tilde on, on top of the omega one. So it's the, this is the, the effective uh, notation frequency. And this is, uh, <clears throat> sorry. So basically if we want to uh, know our DMP enhancement, what we now need to do is solve this equation. And over the next, or in the, in the course of this presentation, what I'm gonna show is how to derive expressions for these three terms. So let's start with the notation frequency, the, the effective notation. Frequency. So the problem, yeah, okay. So the, the thing is that the, what we want to know now is what is the notation frequency for this zero or double quantum uh, transition that lead to DNP enhancement. And the problem here is that the um, microwave Hamiltonian of the, uh, yeah, the microwave Hamiltonian written here is equal to omega one time SX. So S is the, the spin operator of the electron and I just chose arbitrarily that it's going to be uh, pointing along X. If we look at the matrix representation of this Hamiltonian, we see that it only connects single quantum transition of the electron. So we are only, in principle, this microwave is only affecting the electron single quantum transitions. So, the, um, so this, uh, you probably already heard this term uh, that the zero quantum and double quantum transition are formally forbidden. So, but if they are forbidden, how is it possible that we get DNP enhancement? And the answer to this is that the dipole coupling between the electron and the nucleus partially or uh, mixes these, these pure Seaman basis um, states. And this way we introduce some um, effective uh, notation frequency. So I'm gonna uh, show how, how, how we can derive uh, the equation for this effective notation. For that, the first thing that we need to do is look at the total spin Hamiltonian. So um, for the solid effect, all we need is the Seaman interaction of the electron, the nuclear Seaman interaction, and the electron nucleus through space dipolar coupling. And we can build now the, the Hamiltonian in its matrix rep rep representation form. So I'm gonna now one by one and add these terms into this matrix. And so first of all, the, the electron and nuclear Seaman interaction, so they are gonna be on the diagonal. This is uh, as expected because uh, the basis set that we are using here is the Seaman eigenbasis, right? And then the dipolar coupling uh, is a very long term. This is called the dipolar coupling alphabet. And it has, basically it has elements that are gonna be populating the, the matrix uh, all over the place. So for instance, this I said S set is gonna be on the diagonal. The flip-flop terms are gonna be uh, here in the, in the zero quantum uh, position and so on and so forth. So next we're gonna do an, an approximation. We're gonna go into the rotating frame of the electron microwave irradiation and uh, we're gonna do what is called the pseudo-secular approximation. In this pseudo-secular approximation, we're gonna remove all terms that do not commute with the electron Seaman interaction. So, which are most of them in, in this dipolar alphabet. If we do so, we get a, a Hamiltonian that looks um, much nicer. So uh, most of the elements uh, on the off diagonal are zero, but still there are some these pseudo-secular terms that are in the off diagonal. So if we have off diagonal terms in the Hamiltonian, it means that the basis set that we are using is not an eigenbasis uh, of this interaction. So if we want to um, find uh, the proper eigenstate repression, representation, what we need to do is diagonalize this Hamiltonian. And this is shown over here. So this is again the, the, the total spin Hamiltonian and we go into the eigenstate representation by diagonalizing it, applying these two uh, rotation matrices. And now the new eigenstates that we have are, uh, are a linear combination of the original Seaman eigenbasis. <clears throat> so after doing this, now we can look at what is the effect of the microwave Hamiltonian on the, it, within this new representation. And we can do this just by applying the same rotational matrices to the microwave Hamiltonian. And if we do so, and shown over here, we'll, we'll get new elements in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Hamiltonian of the microwave irradiation. So we get elements, uh, in the, that connect the double quantum and the zero quantum transitions. So basically this is our effective notation frequency of the zero quantum and double quantum transition. So 
we, we have solved the first element here in, in this equation. So the effective mutation frequency of the zero quantum or double quantum transition is just equal to the mutation frequency that we, that we put in, the power that we put in, times the dipolar coupling scaled by the nuclear alarm frequency. So um, next, we're going to look at the, at the relaxation terms of this equation. I, and I don't know, may, maybe now this would be a good moment for if there are already questions. I don't know. I, I don't know how to see it. Uh, let's see. If uh, anyone has any questions, go ahead and uh, post them in the Q&A. Uh, I have a quick question that is probably a little bit uh, pedantic, but um, with the equation here uh, in blue that you derived, um, is that actually uh, generalizable to higher uh, orders? So, I mean, block did single quantum, like kind of transition, you're doing double quantum. Could Is there like a generalizable pattern as you go up to like triple and, and like four quantum? Like, presumably it doesn't really matter because at a certain point you're not really going to be observing those kind of things. But I'm just curious from like a mathematical perspective, if there's like a generalizable way of, uh, of looking at that. Uh, I, I, I really don't know. So the, the, the so uh, I'll go back quickly. Basically, I mean, do you, do you just have to write the, the, these rate equations? And I mean, have to just do it manually. It looks like it's going <laughs> to get like more and more complicated. And I yeah. mean, we, to, to get from these rate equations to this final equation, we needed to do a, a few approximations. So one is that the that the electron relaxation rate is faster than anything else, so that the the, mm -hmm. the these populations uh, stay uh, rate the, the the ratio between these populations stay constant. And we also choose that the double quantum and zero quantum relaxation rates are equal. And but I'm, I mean, yeah, I, I don't see I, I haven't seen I don't see a pattern. Like, but okay. like, <laughs> it's like I don't know. Sorry. Yeah, I didn't see a pattern either, but I'm always curious if there is a pattern. As much as I love doing math, I know some people don't, and so. <laughs> but I mean, the, I think the, this equation at the end is, is like really just, I mean, just it it, it 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 looks very similar to the one spin system, right? To just have. Oh the, yeah, yeah. It looks very clean and beautiful. That's why I was like, is this is this a sign that there is a pattern that I'm just not seeing, or? <laughs> I never thought about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well. Um... I haven't seen any questions pop up yet. So I, I mean, so far, so good. It seems very uh, like a clear presentation. So uh, can I ask uh, a quick question? I'm not oh, allowed to that? ask questions in the Q&A, apparently. Oh. As panelists. oh, OK. <laughs> uh, when you were going through the dipolar alphabet um, and you crossed out most of the terms in the um, pseudo sector approximation, there seemed that there was both C and D terms, but then only C appeared in your Hamiltonian? Or maybe I'm missing something uh, there. No, yeah. So. It's yeah, so I mean, C and D are just, uh, I think, uh, 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 one is the complex conjugate of the other. And I okay. think I just, uh, so I, I didn't wrote it there, but yeah, the idea is that that the, the, this should be the, the absolute value of C. All right, great, thank you. And I, I mean, I also crossed out this A term, but it was just like to get the equation cleaner. I mean, it could stay in the diagonal, like, but it's going to be much smaller normally than the nuclear alarm of frequency. So I, I crossed it out. All right. Thank you. OK, so now let's go into relaxation. So I'll start with a quick reminder of what is a relaxation NMR. So relaxation NMR is caused by random fluctuation of local magnetic fields. So this is like a schematic uh, drawing of a local field fluctuating this time. And what we need to know is what are the, the frequencies present in this random fluctuation. And in order to do that, the first thing that we have that we're going to look at is the autocorrelation function of this uh, random fluctuation. So the autocorrelation function is kind of a, of a measure of the memory of this uh, fluctu uh, random fluctuation. So we can calculate this by, by taking the average over time of the function at a time t uh, multiplied by, by, by it's the same function at a time t plus tau. So you see if tau is equal to zero, this would just be the square of the, of the, of the average of the square of the, of the local magnetic field. And however, if tau starts growing, it could be that the, that the local field is changing, right? It could change even sign. And if it changes sign, then the, 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 the value that we obtain here uh, is gonna be negative. So once we take the average, the, the, the total value is gonna be smaller. And if tau goes to infinity, then we, we, we completely lost the, the, the information about the, the initial state. And 
the, the value of the autocorrelation function is going to zero. And uh, we can approximate this, this, this decay as an exponential decay with a characteristic correlation time tau c, uh, which defines the, how fast the, the autocorrelation time decays. So now the next step is we're going to take the Fourier transform of this autocorrelation function, and this will give us a measure uh, of the weight of each frequency present in this random fluctuation. And so the Fourier transform of an exponential decay is just a Lorentzian over here. So the Lorentzian has the correlation time tau c and, and, and the frequency omega. And uh, longitudinal relaxation, so T1, is caused by, by fluctuations at the, at the Larmor frequency. So uh, actually fluctuations of, of local magnetic fields pointing perpendicular to the external magnetic field. And uh, whenever they are at uh, frequencies of the Larmor frequency. Uh, I like to think of it in uh, the same way um, we, we think we, we know that pulses are only able to, to, to cause transitions when they are on resonance. So the same way relaxation is able to, or relaxation is going to act whenever these local magnetic fields are fluctuating at a frequency on resonance with our uh, spin system. So this way, the longitudinal relaxation rate is equal to the spectral density at the nuclear alarm frequency. And we, uh, we can draw here this, the, the famous uh, BPP plot. So the, the T1 relaxation time as a function of the correlation time. And we know that there is a minimum whenever the correlation time equals the, the inverse of the alarm frequency. So, so this is um, relaxation theory, the general relaxation theory, right? But uh, what we are interested here is uh, paramagnetic relaxation enhancement. So relaxation caused by the presence of paramagnetic center. And the reason uh, paramagnetic center are very efficient in causing relaxation is that pa uh, paramagnetic you know, or unpaired electrons have a very large uh, magnetic moment. So they want to create a very strong magnetic field at the surrounding nuclei. And now the fluctuation that, that mediates relaxation can have three different or, or, uh, origins. Sorry. First, uh, chemical exchange. So basically just the, the, the position of nucleus and electron is changing um, over time. Other, uh, second, molecular reorientation. So mole the, the molecule as a whole can, can rotate and this will change also the, the strength of the dipole coupling between uh, the two uh, spins. Or electron spin relaxation. So even if the two uh, electron and nuclear spin are, are fixed in space due to electron relaxation. The magnetic, uh, the, the local field that the nucleus is gonna is gonna sense is gonna change uh, with time. And in fact, this is the the relevant uh, mechanism for us. So because we are doping rigid inorganic materials, there are not many motions capable of of um, efficiently cause relaxation, nuclear relaxation. However, electron relaxation times are, are normally. Uh, orders of magnitude faster than the nuclear relaxation. So the nucleus are uh, going to feel this electron fluctuating back and forward, and this is going to cause uh, nuclear relaxation. This is the so-called paramagnetic relaxation enhancement effect. So next, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little bit into the, into the theory of relaxation. Um, so in NMR, if we, if we want to, um, to, to describe how the system evolves with time, we look at the Lubel von Neumann, equ Neumann equation. So we look how the density matrix change with time. And in the case of relaxation, we have to add to the, to the Hamiltonian that is present also uh, a perturbation. So this perturbation would be the local magnetic field. And you see it's dependent on time because it fluctuates. And from this equation, it is possible to derive the master regression of relaxation. So I'm, I'm not gonna go into this derivation. And, and you're not too familiar with this. Uh, and relaxation theory. I know this is, uh, was a bit fast, so I apologize for that, but hope you stay with me because uh, just looking at this equation, we can, we can learn a bit about um, this paramagnetic relaxation effect. So here, what we're looking at is we're going to see how the, the, the density matrix, the, the average over the density matrix, so this is our, our spin ensemble, changes over time. And the, the, the solution to this, uh, due to the presence of a fluctuating field, and the solution to this is the the integral over tau and of the average of this double commutator. And then from here, we can get the T1 relaxation time, for instance, by looking at the expectation value of the longitudinal uh, magnetization. So we get the trace of, the, of this uh, master equation uh, times I z. And this gives us the longitudinal relaxation time. So if we want to understand now the paramagnetic relaxation enhancement, what we need to do is we have to plug in here the the interaction that is responsible for electron relaxation uh, for nuclear relaxation. So in our case, it's the dipole coupling between electron and nucleus. So I'm going to show again here the 
the dipolar coupling alphabet, but written in a slightly different manner. So in this case, I'm going to follow the, the, the approximations done by, by Lowe and Say back in the 60s. So they, they describe the electron spin as a classic uh, magnetic moment that is fluctuating in time. So S has become uh, time dependent. And in addition, uh, we're gonna, we have to write this, this Hamiltonian in the double rotating frame. So in the uh, rotating frame of the electron and nuclear spin. So that's, that's why we have these additional rotating uh, elements over here. So now the next step that we have to do is we have to plug in the, the, the Hamiltonian into the master regression for excitation. So because there, these are so, there are so many terms here, the, the, a, a big sum, so this is gonna be explored. It's gonna be a really long equation. However, uh, luckily, most of these elements are gonna be zero, either because the commutator is zero or because the, the spectral density that we obtain from them is, is very, very small. So not, not really zero, but we can neglect it. So instead, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you the, 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 the elements that are, that are most important. And th these are these two over here. And what I'm gonna do is just gonna plug in this one over here uh, as, as here into as a function of t and the second element here as a function of t plus tau. So I could have done other way. Uh, up, so we would have, we would need to do also the, the reverse thing, but I'm just gonna look at one for, for simplicity. So this is what, what is shown over here. So basically I'm just plugged in into the, into the integral, these two. So this one is the first element and this one is gonna be the second element over here. So because the, the, the electron spin, we are treating it as a, as a classic magnetic moment, we can remove it also out of the, of the commutator. And in addition, because the nuclear spin operators are not, do not depend upon time, we can remove them out of the time integral. Now, what we see here now is um, we have the, the, the commutator of the nuclear spin operators, and we have an expression as z uh, of tau times a z of uh, time t plus tau. So here's t and here's t plus tau. So this, and uh, you might recognize from the previous slide, uh, is an, like an autocorrelation function. So the solution to, to the average of this uh, product is just uh, the, the, the magnitude of, of this in, uh, magnetic moment times an exponential decay. So because uh, the fluctuation here originates uh, due to the electron relaxation time, actually the correlation time that describes this fluctuation is the T1E, is the electron re longitudinal relaxation time. Okay, and the, the, this commutator just becomes like that. So then the next step, we can look at the integral uh, over tau of these two exponentials. And we're gonna get uh, uh, a Lorentzian. So in this case, so this is our spectral density. And uh, in this case, the correlation time is T1E and uh, we have here the nuclear alarm of frequency. So, if, so basically this is the treatment that we have to do for all elements. And if we do this, we get an expression for, for T1, for, for the, the nuclear longitudinal relaxation rate due to this paramagnetic relaxation effect. And so we have here the spectral density and you see that the dipolar coupling strength goes in a squared. So we have solved the, the next uh, element here of this equation that we, uh, we started looking at. So remember this equation was gonna give, is going to give us the, uh, uh, the DMP enhancement that we can obtain. So we have solved the, the value for the, for the effective mutation frequency and for the uh, nuclear relaxation time whenever uh, nuclear relaxation is dominated by the paramagnetic relaxation due to the um, polarizing agent. So the term that is uh, still over here is the double quantum relaxation rate. And in principle, this would look like the, the most difficult one to solve, but the, the group of Simon Vega came up with a, with a very um, uh, nice and clean way to get an estimate of this relaxation rate. So what they were saying is if electron relaxation it is, is caused by fluctuations of perpendicular fields, and we can treat it the same way we treat the effective mutation frequency of the electron. So basically they thought, okay, there is an operator acting along X or Y that is causing relaxation. So we know if we want to scale it to the double quantum, we know how to do it. We just have to multiply it by the strength of the dipolar coupling scaled by the nuclear alarm of frequency. And so they came up with this, uh, with this uh, equation. So they said, the double quantum relaxation rate is gonna be just the, the electron relaxation rate scaled by this dipolar coupling over the nuclear alarm frequency. And it's gonna, we have to take it squared because relaxation is a, is a second order effect. So same way we had here the, the interaction squared and this one also wants to be squared. So basically now we have uh, an equation for all uh, the terms in this equation. 
And if we look at it more closely, so we see here uh, the term here in the in the, in the uh, denominator, we, we, we get uh, we, we, written out here, we see that the, well, T2E or the R2E, the, the transfer relaxation time of the electron is just, depends on the system, but it's, it does, does, it's not affected by the electronuclear um, dipole coupling. However, the effective mutation frequency squared is going to be proportional to the dipole coupling squared. And also the R1 double quantum is proportional to that um, dipole coupling strength squared and the nuclear relaxation time as well, whenever it is dominated by the Peary effect, right? So because we are taking the, the, the inverse of them, um, they're going to cancel out of the equation. What this means is that, that our DMP enhancement, which is directly related to the uh, double quantum saturation efficiency, is independent of the strength of the dipole coupling. So this means that it is independent of the distance between the polarizing agent and the nucleus that is being polarized. So basically, well, this is the main message. DNP enhancement is independent of this distance. So here again, so if, we, if I have a, a metal ion or whatever polarizing agent, like a pol an, an, an unpaired electron spin, and then the DNP enhancement of a nuclear that is close by is going to be the same as the DNP enhancement of a nucleus that is far away. Of course, the build-up times will be very different. So this one is going to reach an equilibrium much faster than, than this one over here. So the reason for this is basically just that, that the, the dipole coupling mediates or, or uh, enables the hyperpolarization of the nuclei. So as we go farther away, the, the, this, the, the, the polarization becomes slower and slower. But at the same time, because the nuclear relaxation is, is governed by, by paramagnetic relaxation enhancement, we have more and more time. So and these two effects just turn out to perfectly cancel each other. And, and we, we convince ourselves uh, uh, that, that this fact is true also by doing some numerical simulations. So you see here the polarization as a function of the distance between the two spins. And you can see that, that the polar, polarization, the hyperpolarization just uh, stays constant, uh, independent of the distance for, for a given electron relaxation term. And then we also wanted to, to make sure that, that this is true by looking at some uh, experimental data. So for that, we look at this lithium titanium oxide, which we dope with uh, paramagnetic iron three, and uh, we looked at the, the the width of the of the NMR signal as a function of the delays. So, so this is a saturation recovery experiment, and we looked how the full width half max was changing this time. So at very short delays, and we are mostly seeing the the nuclear spin that are closest to the paramagnetic center because they relax fastest or they, they are polarized uh, fastest. And because they are close to the paramagnetic center, they will be broad. So the, the, the initial NMR signal is quite broad. And then as we wait longer and longer, we're going to be uh, polarizing more distant and distant nuclei, which have a sharper line. And therefore, the, the overall full width half max is going to get down. And if we compare the, the, the full width for microwave on and off, we see that they are uh, more or less the same, or they are actually equal. So here is the here is overlay of the spectrum at, at the steady stage. You can see that, that the lines are identical. So this means that, that really the enhancements are homogeneous throughout the sample. So if they were to be uh, more, the, the nuclei close to the paramagnetic center were to be enhanced more, then we would get a broader you know, signal in the case of microwave on as compared to microwave off. But that's not the case. And another consequence of this distance independent is that also the the DMP enhancement is going to be independent of the concentration of the polarizing agent. So if we increase the polarizing agent concentration, we're just going to have a, a smaller mean distance between, between electron and nuclei. But because the enhancement is independent of the distance, uh, this shouldn't change the enhancement. Now, this is exactly what we observed here. So in the same sample, we changed the iron concentration over almost an order of magnitude without, without seeing significant changes in the total DMP enhancement. Of course, the, the build-up times were, 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 were uh, shortest for the, for the highest concentration. And okay, this, there are limits to this, of course. So at the very low concentration range, there, there will be, uh, eventually we will hit a limit where very remote nuclei are gonna relax due to their intrinsic uh, nuclear relaxation, which is, if this is more efficient than the paramagnetic relaxation enhancement from the polarizing agent that might be very, very far away. So these, these regions will be enhanced less and therefore our enhancement is not longer homogeneous and we have less enhancement overall. And then in the high concentration range, at some point the electron-electron the uh, coupling, so the coupling between electron spins themselves is gonna be 
uh, become important and it, it's going to become a, a source of electron spin relaxation. And we know that short electron spin relaxation times are detrimental for DNP enhancement. So in this case, we are also going to um, get lower enhancements. Okay, so um, that was all. So um, to summarize what, what I talked about today, I hope I was able to, so the, this main message that I wanted to, to pass is that as long as the polarizing agent is at the same time the main source of relaxation, then DNP enhancements are going to be independent of the, of the distance between electron and nucleus. And if uh, a little bit of uh, advertisement for uh, one of our publications. So we, if you're interested in, in, this, in this subject in general, we wrote a, a chapter in a book about it and we, where we also discuss more in practical aspects of, of metal ions DNP and how, how to prepare these samples, how to characterize them with EPR and, and so on and so forth. So if you're interested and if you don't have access to this because it's kind of hard to get access to this uh, publications, feel free to, to send me an email. So, and with that, uh, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Great, thank you. Uh, very wonderful talk. Um, so, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and uh, include. Go ahead and type them into the uh, Q and A. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I have a quick kind of uh, general approach. So, or general question: When someone is trying to decide to, to design their DNP experiment. Um, I guess, how does one go about op deciding what the like first place they'll start, like what concentration of dopant? Like, uh, cause it seems like you've done a lot of beautiful work in showing, uh, you know, how you can get a lot of, of enhancement out of, you know, not that many uh, nuclei when it comes down to it and, and trying to find that optimal range where you're covering enough, but not like putting too much of your dopant in. And as you showed, like there, there's a point of diminishing returns, but also, uh, so where, where does the experimentalist start in making that, that uh, kind of approach to their design? So like we, we always like our strategy is always like we, we, we dope a sample and we go to the EPR. So yeah. first <laughs> we, we need to, to have an EPR signal. If we have it, it means that we have the, 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 the polarizing agent uh, that we want. So we, we like we want polarizing agents uh, that have uh, long living, like long electron relaxation time. So normally like if the oxidation state that we are looking for should have uh, long at long relaxation times. So if we have an EPR signal, that, that's already a good sign. So I mean, and, and then like we, in general, I would still do a series of concentrations and see whenever the EPR line starts getting broad, that, that's, a, that's a moment to where, where, where you should, should stop because then it means okay. that just interactions have become too strong. And I mean, it, it, it's hard to say, like, I mean, if you want, if you, you don't want to put too much because you don't want to, to change the properties of your sample. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you put, put too little, even if you have the same level of enhancement, your relaxation times are going to be very long. Like in, th in these inorganic solids, we, if we don't dope them and look at, for example, lithium-6, we can easily have relaxation times that are beyond thousands of seconds. So uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the good thing is we have a really broad range. So <laughs> it, it's, it's easy to get, get it right if you have the... Yeah. The right polarizing agent and the right doping strategy so the okay. concentration is not that much of an issue so when you do get to your optimized um set setup um how long does it take to actually collect like what you'd consider the nice spectrum as it uh as someone who doesn't has never done dnp myself i i've been around it a lot i'm always fascinated by it so i know mm. that getting to the point that you're collecting it is not always uh, easy <laughs> by any means but uh when you do it's it uh how long is that experimental time yeah that's the nicest part about you once you get one time like you, you're trying to i don't know you do a like you see one scan and you see already a signal that like, <laughs> and that's it, like so yeah that's i mean if you have an enhancement of 100 then like you can look at oxygen 17 at natural abundance and like just in a, in a few scans, you have a nice looking spectrum. So that, that's it. So yeah. I mean, I mean the, the challenge is find the optimum position. So for that, it's also 
uh, important to to know the EPR properties of your polarizing agent. So mm -hmm. if you if you use nitroxide bioradicals, you you already know where you have to go. But because the we, we are doping our sample, the EPR properties of our metal ions are going to be different in each sample. So we really need to have a good initial guess of where to put our magnetic field. And for that, we, we always characterize them first with EPR. Well, I'll go ahead and uh, hand it over to uh, Michael. I think he has another question uh, for you, yeah. maybe a more knowledgeable question too. <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, yeah, no, th thanks for the talk. I enjoyed it. Um, so you, you mentioned very briefly that you didn't need spin diffusion to get uniform enhancements through the sample. I wondered if you could comment on what differences you'd have if you do have spin diffusion versus if you don't. Actually, I mean, this is something like, so all, all the examples I'm showing here are like uh, on very low sensitivity nuclei where we know there is no spin diffusion. So right now, actually, Ilya Moros in our group is, is working on, on, on finding this, this difference between, between having spin diffusion and not having spin diffusion. And uh, I think we are getting like really uh, interesting results, which are like basically uh, whatever I, I told you here for without spin diffusion is also true in the case of spin diffusion. So uh, it, it, it's basically uh, the same. I mean, the, because the relaxation is the, the, the same consideration. If relaxation is mediated by, by paramagnetic relaxation enhancement, then the, the, the story continues being true independently how the, how the distant nuclear got relaxed either directly or like through spin i mean spin diffusion also transfer relaxation right so so in the end it, it turn, seems to be like i mean we're still working on it but it, it seems to be very very similar yeah. Yeah, nice uh i'm gonna ask a second question while, while i'm here and then i'll pass back to the the, the audience but uh so I, I've looked at systems where sort of lower concentrations had improved the, the DMP. And I think I was trying to work out why that was different to what you observed when it was kind of flat. And I think it um, potentially has to do with the, the EPR line width. Um, so uh, when the EPR line width is dominated by um, electron electron interactions, it matters the concentration. So in, in the sort of systems you were looking at, uh, what's kind of dominating your EPR um, line width. Um, so so no, normally it's, it's, it's the so I didn't mention it, but these are all high spins, <laughs> and we're just getting NDMP enhancement mostly from the central transition, and the central transit. But still, even, we, we're looking for for system with uh, as small zero field splitting as possible. But still, the central transition is normally broadened by by second order zero uh, field splitting contributions. So it's it's inhomogeneous broadening of the of the lines. Okay. Yeah. So I think I was looking at something that was pretty cubic, so that maybe is, is the difference there. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. We have a, a couple of questions here from the audience. Uh, first from an anonymous attendee saying, uh, thank you for the nice talk. And I was wondering what would be the minimum requirement for the electron spin T1 and T2 for DNP? Um, like bulk like some rule is like it should be longer than a microsecond i would say if it gets shorter than a microsecond then it's just too hard to saturate these transitions i mean at least with, like with our gyrotron with, and our spin system which has no but like you know the, the commercial broker and uh, dmp probes they don't have a a proper cavity like uh, so so i would say uh, around microseconds all right, now for T1E and T2E, like, I mean, we always assume T2E is kind of equal to T1E, but I don't know how good of that, an assumption this is. It's just hard to, to, to measure it. So, mm -hmm. so I would say for T1E, it's about microseconds and hope that T2E is not too short. All right, and then we have uh, another question here from uh, Kevin von uh, Witt uh, saying, great talk. If T1E and T2E become very long, speaking of seconds or even longer, would this be advantageous, or does this, uh, or does the shown derivation uh, make an implicit assumption about the relaxation times, e.g., that the uh, electron uh, after driving the DNP transition relaxes fast enough to be again in a thermal equilibrium electron state? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, my question, like, uh, so I, I, I think so. I think that 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 eat each. Um, that, that we need the electron to 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 repopulate 
each and every time. So the electron relaxation time should should should, should account for as many nuclei as as we are uh, enhancing in, in a given time. So, uh, but I mean, if the, if the electron relaxation time is, is in the order of microseconds and the buildup time is in the order of tens or hundreds of seconds, then we are we have a lot of a lot of uh, these repopulations. If T1e and T2e become, I, I, I honestly had never thought about them being seconds. I think we are like, we never had the problem that our electron relaxation times were too long. We we're always facing the, the opposite problem. So, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I think these, these questions are more like, um, probably people that do dissolution DMP know, know, know better about it because they go to really low temperature and they have long electron relaxation times. And I think that they start facing these type of problems. But, uh, I, I, I don't have a good, good answer to this. Right. And we have another uh, anonymous Cindy uh, asking, would it be possible to perform DNP with metal centers with uh, integer spins, uh, maybe with parallel mode EPR? Um, I mean, I, uh, I, I don't know about parallel mode. I like parallel mode, if you are, I really don't know much about it. So I, 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 I can I can comment on that. I mean, in, in general, like in, with our setup, uh, definitely not because because the same same reasoning. Like the electron relaxation times are gonna be gonna be way too long, right? We we need we need to either like all, all until now, like all uh, all DMP metal ions for DMP that I am aware of, they used either uh, spin one half metal ions like. Like chromium or, or vanadium, or, or half um, half filled uh, shells. So, for example, in manganese two, iron three, they are D five electron spin. So we have um, very so half filled shells give you la long electron relaxation times, and so and then we can look at the central transition only. So and or or the spin one half only, but but for 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 integer spins, I, I never saw anything. Uh, All right, and then we have uh, another panelist question. So, Asif, if you, you want to get in here. Yeah. Daniel, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Really nice talk. I have a question. So, you said PRE is the main source of relaxation for the nucleus. If that is so, whether you have microwave on or off, that will change the autocorrelation function for the nucleus. So, the line width should have been different if PRE was the main source. And um, I, I mean, the, 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 the only work where I'm aware that... that gymnastic yeah. would be different than microwave being off. Um, so, I, I mean, I think the only work where I, where I, where I saw that the PRE effect was changing uh, due to microwave being on or off was like from the Songi Han group. I, I don't know if you were on, on that work, but like, I mean, in general, like it's... Uh, I, I think the effect of like uh, the, the effect of microwave on the on the PRE effect is going to be very very small. So I think like uh, I think this is about uh, electron like like decoupling, right? Uh, I mean that, that when you when you have like uh, microwave radiation, you start uh, decoupling the, the the interaction between the electron and the nuclear spin. But like I, I think at the electron relaxation times that that we have, this is not an issue. Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe when you have, um, like, like the the previous question, if you have electron relaxation times that are in the order of seconds, then th this this becomes important. But, but, but for our case, I mean, microfluid radiation is just like a coherent effect that 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 won't cause that that won't that 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 won't change the the PRE, right? Like if you are just coherently oscillating the electron spin, that that that's not a source of relaxation. Mm 